This week, Japan appointed a minister of loneliness. This seems, this sounds strange. Like, it, it just sounds like some sort of bizarre, dystopian, fantastical sci-fi plot point. But no, this is a real thing. And this is actually very important. Loneliness is the hidden pandemic. It's the pandemic that's been going on since before the COVID pandemic started. Loneliness is now a... A, a normal state of affairs for most people, especially those living in the West. It's been a social transition that's been happening over the course of the 20th century, and a lot of it has to do with this idea of privacy and of, of individualism, individuality being conflated with individualism. Now, what do I mean by individuality versus individualism? Well, individuality is like it's you. It's it. what makes up you as an individual, as a, as a person of your own. It's your thoughts and your feelings and your drives and your dreams and all those things that, are, that make you unique. Individualism, on the other hand, is, well, it's a bit of an ideology. Individualism is what makes you the focus of your own world. Individualism is effectively what came along with liberalism to make the individual be the locus of all political activity, rather than in the before time it being a matter of the community, the, the communal responsibility to one another and to the world around you. Now there's this focus on individual choice, individual feelings and thoughts and needs and, and whatnot. Now this is a, a good thing. This is in part at least a good thing. It's important that the individual's needs are being taken care of, that the individual's desires are taken care of, and that our individual drives are what drives society, that, that creates this democratic society that we live in. But there's a dark side to individualism at the same time. When the most important thing is the individual's choices, there's very little attention being paid to the responsibility of the individual to society itself. And this, the impact of this thing is both subtle and wide-ranging. I would argue that one of the biggest impacts is the shift towards consumer choice, replacing that of collective decision-making. In this modern age, we have basically the choice of buying thing A versus thing B, electing politician thing A versus politician thing B, and very little choice in terms of collective decision-making. We don't really have the ability to get together with one another in order to make broad-ranging, wide-scale decisions. An example of, like, labor unions is one such example where this is the case, where a group of people at a workplace can come together and collectively decide to stand up to the bosses. But in the case of modern politics, at least in North America, we're basically just left with a choice of which politician we want to make all of our decisions for us. And while that has impacts, we don't have any direct control over the, the path of our government. And the same sort of thing could be the case of, uh, of businesses, of our, our local community as well. As a side effect, the idea of consumer choice has replaced that of democratic decision making. And as such, our choice of what it is that we buy, we quote-unquote vote with our dollars. And this kind of leads into part of the reason for this epidemic of loneliness. In the 1950s and 60s started this move into the suburbs, where rather than living in basically communal living situations in the city, there was this drive towards every family, every person owning their own home out in the suburbs, away from the city, which is to say that they also own a car so that they get from their home in the suburbs into the city. And even at that time, it was the evidence was there that this is not necessarily a good thing. I'm not begrudging anybody, anybody the choice to have their own home in the suburbs and drive into the city for work or not or whatever, but there was a rapid uptick in loneliness at that time. There was a, a mass reporting of anxiety and depression and isolation among this new suburban class of people. And at first it, it hit the housewives at first because, well, they're, they're alone potentially with the kids, but they don't really have any real connection to their local community. Yes, you've got your parent-teacher association and that sort of thing, but most days, most of the time, 
You're just alone in your house, and that's kind of painful, in fact. We need one another to actually feel whole because we are social beings. There's a reason why solitary confinement is among one of the worst forms of torture that you can do to someone. And as such, this loneliness epidemic has only just grown. And the valorization of privacy, the valorization of having your own personal private space has just intensified. It's turned into this, this most valuable high aspiration to have one's own castle and what one's own privacy, and the more money you can get, the more privacy you can buy. If you're exceedingly wealthy, well, you can buy yourself a, your own little castle with a walled garden and basically never have to see anybody ever again. And as the decades have passed since that time, well, these trends have intensified pretty substantially. Since the internet age, since the mass media age, well, it's become increasingly possible to just not leave your house. Still be able to live most of a life not having to depart your house, not having to see people on a regular basis. You can, a lot of people can work from home and go to school from home, and a lot of folks just kind of disappear into their own space. And that's especially the case in Japan, where there's a, a whole class of people that basically live their lives in complete isolation. And of course, when COVID came along, when this pandemic showed up and it was, well, prescribed that we all stay home, and for very good reason, like I'm not saying that we shouldn't be staying home, this obviously gave even more reason to be doing this and, well, created more of a situation for more people to be stuck in this lonely situation. Prompting this situation in Japan is a, a huge increase in suicides. There was a... a there, it's a significant problem in that country, and increasingly so around the world. As birth rates fall, and as uh, people start having smaller families, and there's this incredible increase in demogra dem demographic age, the average age of people is, is rising so fast and so high that families can't really keep up. And there are a great number of older adults and elderly people that are basically just alone. They don't have families around them to take care of them, and they, their families, their children have all moved out and moved on and had their own lives, and they're basically just alone. Not only is suicide a problem, but also what's, what's termed lonely deaths, basically just people who die of something or other, whether it be cancer or natural causes of some sort, or are sometimes, yeah, just loneliness, and they're just not discovered for days. There's nobody to check in on them. There's no regular social contact that they're missing from, so nobody has reason to go looking. And Japan is, well, it's a very highly developed society, and they are somewhat, they're portending what's happening to the rest of the world. As birth rates continue to fall, as demographic ages continue to rise, as our world continues to move increasingly online and our, you know, our logistic systems are, are basically outsourced to delivery people and, and things that we don't ourselves have to do to leave the house to go and do, well, this is going to start becoming a problem increasingly for the rest of the world. I myself have felt extremely isolated for my entire life. I've lived in a, a very um, secluded way and sometimes by choice, sometimes not by choice. I am a very socially awkward and anxious kind of a guy, so sometimes being out in public, being around people is overwhelming, so I do like being alone at home. I live alone. But there is something about the human psychology that needs other people. We need to be around other people. We need to be able to talk to people. Our minds don't function correctly unless we have that social contact. And I hate to be a broken record, but this is, again, the fault of capitalism. The fault of consumerism and capitalism, for that matter. There's this tendency in capitalism to outsource all public goods to the private sector. Whereas we used to have a public space, a public sphere, where you could go outside in the square and meet people, see people, talk to one another, and do, do what human beings do. It's now an increasingly privatized world. There are very few public spaces that you can go to and just exist in and be with other people without having to buy stuff or have this implied pressure to move on. If you're loitering too long in a park or something like that, well, policeman's going to show up and 
telling you to move along because you're acting like a vagrant, whether you're homeless or not homeless, you're loitering, technically, and there's laws against being in parks in the middle of the night for much the same reason. This cuts off one of our, our major sources of interpersonal react interaction. We don't have the ability to just run into people in those sorts of environments because it's a little bit hostile. And for that matter, in the, in the circumstances where we do run into one another, uh, often it's usually in a place like a bar or a coffee shop where, well, you have to buy something to be there. You can't exactly just go into a bar or coffee shop and loiter there for hours on end and just hang out with people. They're going to want you to buy a beer or coffee or biscotti or some avocado toast or something like that. And other institutions like churches used to be one of the main uh, places where you could go and live in a live among other people with a low pressure environment but churches are becoming less relevant to our society there's this huge increase in secularism which i mean is understandable the rational age has already passed and so few people see much use in churches anymore and those that do well many of them belong to superstitious judgmental churches that are somewhat hostile in their own way which is not to say that all churches are bad, because, well, I, I go to a church myself. Don't believe in God, but I do go to a church for this very reason. It's a group of people that I know I can trust and love and be around and not feel pressure to buy things or do a certain set of things, but rather I can just belong to something, be part of a community. But for most people, what we're left with is, well, social media. And this has great potential. It's a good idea in theory. It's a way that people who are physically separated can still interact, can still broadcast a message to people that they know and be able to interact in a passive sort of way, basically a public sphere, like a park or a public square or something like that, but on the internet. It's really cool. And I remember the, I remember the early internet being really awesome like this. Like I, I have friends who I met on the internet back in the 90s even, whom I still have never met in real life, never met physically in person, never even talked to on the phone. But some of these folks I feel very close to. I know them well, I know their families, I know their whole life history, uh, just by participating in the text on the screen and, and getting to know them that way, participating in online games and events like that. Cat. But the thing about these platforms is, well, they have to make money. The Facebook platform is, well, it's one of the biggest advertising platforms in the entire world. They're among the largest and most wealthy media companies that sells advertising. And of course, all of the data that you're leaving behind as you're moving around on the internet and interacting in these social media, whether it be the photos you post or the content that you create for, say, oh, I don't know, YouTube, and all the just marketing data that gets accrued, Every time you click on something, every time you're looking at an advertisement or buying a product or something like that, it's watching you. It knows. And they're selling that data about you to other people so that they can sell you stuff. Basically, what this is doing is it's putting a, a, a flywheel on the bicycle wheel of our socialization impulse. You know how like on a bicycle in the olden days when you wanted a, a a light on your bicycle in order to generate power you'd put like a little wheel on the back wheel of the bicycle and that would draw a little bit of your energy from pedaling and put it into running that light this is basically what's happening with the social media it's putting a little wheel on our socialization impulse and drawing off a little bit of that energy and monetizing it selling basically our socialization back to us but the problem is that does take a little bit of energy away from our socialization. You might not notice it, you might not even care, but it is definitely slowing down or impeding our socialization in, in some way. And I think that impact is more noticeable than it seems. I think that in this highly monetized environment where you know you're being surveilled and where content which is which is sensationalized and exciting and marketable is privileged over content which is you know just standard socialization this impacts the way that we interact with one another it interacts our, our it impacts our way of viewing the world and as such it's 
well, it's caused this epidemic of loneliness to get even worse. And I gave up scrolling for Lent, because I, I recognize the impact that it's having on my own personal psychology, but I don't plan on quitting social media because, well, there's a social cost to that. I would end up being disconnected from all the people that I know only on social media. My circle of friends would just instantly shrink a bit. There's not necessarily anything wrong with having a small group of friends as long as you're well connected with them and it's feeding your social impulse, but I, I like those people. I like the kind of interactions that I can have in this medium where it's not limited by space and time. It can be asynchronous, it can go across the world, I can meet people that I never would have had a chance to in real life. People who are very much aligned with my interests. People who are incredibly interesting I've met over the internet. But I would prefer this medium, prefer this social space not to be sapped in the way that it's being sapped. There's a danger in this that we pay, become asocial creatures and increasingly neurotic as we lose our social impulses. We really do need to have a change to this, and personally I, I would think that we should be nationalizing or internationalizing or demonetizing these social networks. We should have a platform like Facebook, like Twitter, like something like that, that is not impacted, not influenced by any of the rhythms of capitalism, so that it is in fact a purely neutral platform that is just there for communication, not there to sell your eyeballs, because that's the primary function of any of these social media platforms. I don't know exactly how to get there, I don't know of anybody who's working on such a thing, maybe you know, I'd, I'd like to know about it if you know of anything. But I hope that we can find some way forward, because I don't like this. I don't feel good about it, and probably you don't either. So I hope, I hope something changes. Anyway, I do these videos daily, so if you enjoy my content, uh, feel free to like the video and subscribe to the channel, because uh, I always have more. And maybe check out one of those videos if you're interested, and um, share it with other people if you could. I appreciate the uh, help in making a new audience. So thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow.